welcome to Stanford Cinema, the film discussion podcast where you choose it, I watch it, we discuss it. As always, I'm your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this episode. Today, we are going to be covering the 1977 disaster film, Roller Coaster. And joining us is a, a favorite a favorite guest of the show, if you will, Dr. John Bukowski. And he's going to be telling us about his brand new novel, which I'm holding in my hands. It is called Checkout Time. And this novel is fantastic. Now, at the time of recording, I hadn't read this, but Dr. John, being as incredible a person as he is, sent me a copy, a signed copy, if you will. And I was kind of holding off on releasing this episode until I finally finished it. And ladies and gentlemen, I concluded reading Checkout Time, and this novel is so good, so good. And John's going to tell us a little bit about it. And of course, we're going to tackle Roller Coaster, but... I just wanted to pitch a um, an endorsement to check out time. This novel is so much fun, and Dr. John is going to tell us a little bit about it. And um, let's just uh, let's just quit beating around the bush. Let's bring him on. Well, John, hello. Thank you very much for coming back on the podcast. How are you? I'm very good, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure talking with you. Yes, absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I've had this, I've had this on my radar for quite some time after our first conversation, and you teased your your latest work. I was really excited to get into it. And then there was conversation that you might want to talk about the movie Roller Coaster, which was a film I hadn't seen before, but I was pretty pretty excited at the prospect. So now that we're able to bring this to life, I'm 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 looking forward to this conversation. But um what's new with you? Well, uh as you said, a couple of months ago, I uh my latest thriller checkout time came out. So that's exciting, doing the uh, marketing and uh, stuff for that. Um, and it's funny, I recommended uh, Roller Coaster because it was one of the inspirations for writing Checkout Time. Because as we're going to discuss in Roller Coaster, where we've got an extortion bomber extorting uh, uh, basically amusement parks, I've got a uh, extortion bomber known mysteriously as Conrad Hilton, mm -hmm. who's uh, extorting a group of hotel owners. He's pursued by a beautiful FBI agent and a handsome government researcher, at least until he turns the tables and the hunters become the hunt. Ooh. I mean, right. That's just, that's just juicy. That's tasty. That's fun. Like I said, that's just right up like my, my alley and everything. So, um, so I guess, I mean, obviously you, you kind of give us that little snapshot of the kind yeah, of the, that's the, the kind of an elevator pitch. If, if I ever yeah. get an elevator with Steven Spielberg, that's kind of what I'd say. Yeah. What, what I'm kind of curious about for you when it comes to, I'm sorry, the, the previous novel, it was Project, no. Um, previous one was Project Suicide. Project Suicide, right. And it was, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of curious, John, like where, where does an idea for you originate? Well, in the case of checkout time, uh, the idea actually came up probably about 10 or 12 years ago and just kind of sat on the back burner. Um, I was in a hotel on business and I was on the fourth floor of a Ramada or something. I don't know. And uh, I looked up at the ceiling and there was a trap door. And it was kind of those, you know, it doesn't really have a lock, just kind of one of those buttons that you can stick a bobby pin in there and turn. And it would pop open. And I said, wow, you could put something up there. Because it was clearly to get into the suspended ceiling. And of course, you know, the writer's mind starts to talk, what if? What would you put up there? Well, you could put up a uh, microfilm and you'd have a spy thriller. You could put mob money and some guy checks in and the money falls at his feet. You know, and now he's being chased by the mob. you got a crime thriller. Uh, my bent was to go to and put a bomb up there. <laughs> and one of the reasons for that is growing up, I was a bit of a pyro maniac. Uh, <laughs> I, I loved burning trash. I loved, uh, uh, anything that blew up used to make my own gunpowder. And so that was my first go-to. Okay. You put a bomb up there. Why? 
Well, that's where Roller Coaster came in. And I thought, wow, that's a good segue. That's a good mm -hmm. idea. Uh, and uh, of course, when I came up with that, I said, okay, what kind of bomb could you bring in? You know, because you can't get anything on a on an airplane or things like that. And I thought, we can bring anything into a hotel room. You know, you could walk in with a backpack nuke and all they do is give you your little uh, key card and point you to the elevators. <laughs> so uh, I figured, okay, I can work with lots of different explosive and incendiary devices, uh, have a lot of fun researching how you make napalm or thermite at home. And uh, uh, I think the FBI is probably watching my feed now. <laughs> but uh yeah so that was the real inspiration for that one mm -hmm. in the case of check out time what your your recent novel and congratulations how's everything going with 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 the new novel it's going fine i'm uh it just came out a couple of months ago so i'm still building out and i got a couple of conferences i'm going to what i'm teaching at in about a month in louisville kentucky uh, i'm going to talk about how you do research in fiction writing and uh, so it's going to get more play there and stuff. Frankly, I never know how it's selling until I get like a quarterly uh, royalties from my publisher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's true for anybody who publishes, uh, you know, not uh, self-published. Yeah. Now, in the case of this novel, I mean, is it would you would you categorize as kind of like a kind of like a like a dual kind of like hero that you've got because you, you've got like a you, it's yeah. basically. Kind of. It's it's uh, the main protagonist is Thomas Tomasinski, the government researcher, uh, or as he is called to his chagrin, Tom Tom. That's his nickname in the book. And the main, the second dairy, but still very strong protagonist is uh, Sally Butterworth. She's a beautiful FBI agent. And her nickname is Sally Pancakes. <laughs> And Butterworth, yeah, pancakes, yep. She's actually in a world where her looks do her more harm than good, at least in her mind. Mm. She, she's more of a of a of a all business. She wants to excel in the man's world, and uh this kind of gets in the way, but not the Tom Tom. He thinks it's very attractive. So we have some of that interplay going on as they chase Conrad, then Conrad chases them. Right. And in this world, are we because I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, unfortunately, I haven't I haven't got my hands on the book yet, but just doing just even like the research and understanding. But from a time perspective, are we is it is it contemporary? Does it take place? Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, there's uh, I don't think there's anything really that makes it historical at all. Mm -hmm. Now, when when you write. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious just because as, as a writer myself, people ask me this. So I feel compelled to ask other writers these type of questions when an idea, when, when, whenever the inception occurs, do you, do you think concept first? Do you think character? Do you, uh, do you think theme like, or is it depends on that piece of, that piece of work that you're looking at for this, in the case of checkout time, I mean, you obviously talked about hotel, um, that hotel uh, experience that you had and kind of like the little trap door element. So was it, was it kind of concept or did you have a character in mind or where, where do your ideas kind of have that their inceptions? I would say it's concept first. And when I come up with ideas, whether it's for a short story or a novel, I keep a list on my phone. So I, uh, Stephen King says he never keeps a list. He just remembers them. I couldn't do that. I would say I have a great idea, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I do that. And that pretty much first. The characters come about. Um, I would say more, there, there's there, there's secondary, but they then form kind of the. The core and how the plot. Evolves, because when they gel in my head. I have a very clear idea of who they are and how they're going to re behave or react to situations. Uh, when I did Project Suicide, uh, my character Deacon Creel, I wanted a very flawed genius. And uh, in 
and checkout time. I kind of modeled in a little after myself. I've been a researcher in government. I wasn't a specialist in commercial fires as he is for uh, NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. But uh, I've been there, so I kind of know the mindset, know how the uh, insides of the buildings look, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the FBI agent went, I, I knew I wanted her to be very strong. And she's probably the strongest female character I've written. In many respects, uh, her personality is more masculine than Tom's in that she is pursuing this career. And this is this is basically her main goal in life, despite her good looks or in spite of her good looks. And uh, I didn't know as much about the FBI as I do about government buildings, you know, and government, how, how government at the national and state level operates. And I could have just imagined what those things were, because let's face it, we all think we know what an FBI office looks like. We've seen Silence of the Lambs. I remember the old FBI show with Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. in the 60s and 70s, you know, and there's been other FBI shows and CIA, CSI and things like that. So we all think we have a pretty good idea, and probably to a certain extent we do. Um, and you can tap into that as a writer. You don't have to research it necessarily. But I wanted to get more. So I contacted uh, two FBI field offices because the action and checkout time takes place basically between southern Ohio uh, and eastern Tennessee. Again, write what you know. It's what I'm familiar with. I travel that I-75 corridor a lot. And so I knew it would take place in the Knoxville and the Cincinnati field offices to a certain extent. And so I asked, can I get a tour? And the PR department, you send them an email. And the one in Cincinnati said, no, the special agent in charge decides that and they don't want it. And the one in Knoxville said, sure, when do you want to do it? So I think it was about five years ago. I, uh, and during the summer, I uh, drove to the Knoxville field office, got a very nice tour by the PR person, about an hour private tour. I met the special agent in charge, talked with the armorer about weapons, uh, saw where they interrogate prisoners and where they bring the prisoners in on the ground floor, uh, the big conference room where they have all the TVs. If there's really a breaking thing they're working on, they'll have news feeds and everything from all over the world on it. Uh, and so that was some really nice bits from that have made it into the book. You know, it's not about what FBI field offices look like, but I think people will get a little bit more of a feel for what it's like inside those places because I saw first. That is so cool. So just literally kind of like cold calling uh, the FBI, like, hey, could I have yeah, a tour? And uh, I did not know what their policy was. And I was told at the Cincinnati field office that the policy is the special agent in charge. And by the way, they're all special agents. <laughs> and I often wondered, is there FBI agents and then there's special agents and there? No, there's FBI special agents. And the one that heads up a field office is the special agent in charge. That's and really funny. The special agent in charge in Cincinnati had that decision, said no. And I told them that I was a writer and I was researching for a book and that I would not put the FBI in a bad light. And I didn't. Um, but in Knoxville, the very nice woman who was the uh, uh, special agent in charge, very pleasant, we had a nice chat. She said, sure, go ahead. Now they did say, when they introduced me to everyone, they said, uh, this is Dr. John Bukowski. Uh, he's a writer, so be careful what you say. <laughs> <laughs> he writes it down. <laughs> But uh, but no, it's a very pleasant visit and uh, very impressive, I would say, and uh, got some very nice tidbits for the book. Yeah, that, I mean, that also has to be kind of like a fun little like party brag, like when you're like, hey, yeah, uh, one time the FBI gave me a tour of their uh, their yeah. office. And, 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 and like I said, I was expecting maybe there might be two, three people. I was the only one. It was just for me. Like back in my Navy days, because uh, I, I was a I was a journalist in the Navy and the the first half I was on a ship, but the back half of my enlistment, 
I work for the Atlantic Fleet, like public affairs office. Sure. And people would reach out to us yeah. wanting like aircraft carrier tours or base tours. And, you know, we, we'd facilitate those type of things. But so I know obviously tours do exist, but the whole idea of getting a tour like a, an FBI field office is kind of kind of wild. And where you just brought up the the agent, uh, special agent, they're all special agents. It does remind me of a scene in Die Hard from 1989 where we meet these two FBI agents. They're both, same, both named Johnson. But in the movie, and of course, this is just you know, a movie, but one guy's like, this is Agent Johnson. I'm Special Agent Johnson. No relation. Uh, but yeah, like just the whole idea. Yeah, what... I, I, I have no idea what their what their ranking structure is in yeah. the Navy. You know, I, I know I know how to explain it, but I have no idea what the I, FBI sure ranking there, structure works. There's a seniority system, but basically it goes special agent. And then there are like, I don't know the exact title, but there are like section agents in charge of sections. Mm, uh-huh. And there's an assistant special agent in charge. Actually, there's two of them. One oversees the uh the Justice Department operations, law enforcement operations of the uh, field office, and the other is administrative, mm-hmm. with the janitors and all that stuff. So there's uh, two uh, assistant special agents in charge, and then there's the special agent in charge who runs the field office. And there's probably like 20 or 25, maybe 25 or 30 FBI field offices in the country and then they have a, uh probably about twice that number or maybe three times that number in what they call resident agencies which are little small five to 15 agent uh organizations that will be like uh, for example the cincinnati field office and there's a cleveland field office but there's also a resident agency in uh, columbus a resident agency in dayton ohio so uh, this kind of make up the fill in the spaces around the country. I could go on an entire direction, just wanting to, like to get into like Silence of the Lambs, and then segue over into like the X Files, and just have a whole conversation about the FBI. But let's try to keep it a little bit more streamlined. I do want to talk just about the idea of story with you, if if you've got a moment, and then we'll then we'll get into into roller coaster because obviously this is kind of like a high concept idea that you've got with with this film so narratively and when it comes down to structurally and and how you compile this story high concepts only going to get you so far right so what i'm i'm kind of curious is how do you how do you build on i've got a really interesting idea how am i going to how am i going to turn this into a 300 plus page yeah. you know, narrative structure to make this compelling for the reader uh, to want to go along on this journey? Well, a lot, obviously, every writer is going to do this a little differently, but there are two main camps that these people always talk about, two main camps, and how to do that. One is the plotter. You basically spend, say, the first month or month and a half just outlining what you want to have happen, you know, storyboard it. Um, and then you fill in that outline. There may be some changes along the way, but that's basically right at the beginning. You know how it's going to go. You know what the ending is going to be. You know uh, who's going to do what where. And that, I would think, works the best probably for a mystery because you've got to be able to drop clues and you can't uh, you can't paint yourself in the pelt in the corners. So the outlining those really would work really well for something like that. Then there's they call pantsers which what, I am a pantser. Stephen King is a pantser. And it means you do it by the seat of your pants. You start off with the idea and you start to write. And you maybe have an, I, you have an idea where the direction you're going to go and maybe an idea for the beginning. And the beginning is probably the easiest to write. It's all difficult, but the beginning is easiest because you've got the concept. You've, you've already gelled the characters you know, you're going to put them in their situation and go. And likewise, the finale, the end is usually easier because, you know, once you've come up with that idea, then it's like a roller coaster to the end. It's the middle that's the most difficult. Right. 
And for a pantser, that's why, and that's what I've had to learn over the years, because I used to be a technical writer. And a technical writer, you go in a very straight line. You want to be clear. You want to get the information across in an interesting way. But you don't want to waste a lot of words on it. You want to just get right to it. Whereas with a novelist, you got to add in the twists and turns, build the characters, build the theme in. Uh, and for me, themes always come kind of while I'm writing. It kind of occurs to me what the theme is going to be. But you've got to do all this stuff that fills it out, makes it inter entertaining, interesting. Uh, people get to like the characters, or in the case of Conrad Hilton, dislike the character. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's... That's kind of how I do it. And sometimes the characters surprise me and do things that I don't expect. Or there's a plot twist I didn't expect when I was starting out with. That's a lot of time. And I think for a thriller where you already basically know what's happened or what's, you know, and you're chasing them, I think that's a good idea. If you're surprised, well, the reader's going to be surprised. Thank you very much for uh, providing that insight just on how it works with you. And yeah, again, just uh, just to see how different writers, how, I mean, the process, right? No two writers really have the same exact process. So thank you for giving us just a little peek inside uh, how it works. I just want to show you the cover. I'm sorry about the glare. No, but yeah, I, I saw the cover I, uh, because I, I, I checked it out on Amazon and I think I even saw it on on Target's website as well. So I, I saw the it's pretty cool, man. I'm I, I'm not yeah, I, I'm not I, trying I, to hype you more than just having you on the show, but like I'm I'm really excited about this novel. I worked with I worked with my publisher and their cover designer, and this one really struck me because it's a shadowy figure, and for much of the book we don't know who Conrad Hilton is, uh, and there's fire in the background. And with the yellow and orange letters, I think it came out really cool. No, a hundred percent. I'm I'm glad that you even you brought that up because I was actually had that in my notes that I wanted to discuss is the fact that that's not that the cover sells, but a cover doesn't hurt either. Oh, and no. having having a sexy cover, I mean, I've got my whole like collection of Stephen King like eighties like hardbacks back there, and you brought, just because you had brought up Stephen King a couple times. Um, when I think of my, you know, um, 70s and 80s Stephen King were all the rage when I was a kid. So like I knew like at a very young age what the cover of it looked like or what the cover of the stand looked like. And and so those are the editions of the hard covers that I want. I, you know, I mean, they've done reprints and whatnot, but I always knew that I was compelled to those stories, not on cover alone, but they didn't hurt. And that's kind of the point I'm saying is a cover, a good, co well-executed cover is still going to definitely bring the attention. In the case of checkout time, that's a, that's a sexy cover. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, that's true is when you're just glancing like in a bookstore or, or down a scroll uh, online, the cover catches your attention. For me, it's the cover catches your attention. Then I read the back cover blur. Is yeah. this the kind of story I would want to read? And then I read the first page because I want to see if they can write. Yep. Because I have, I mean, I've seen some great concepts and they say concept trumps writing, which is probably true, at least in the industry. But I want, I don't want to read bad writing. Mm -hmm. I just end up cursing at the page, especially <laughs> as a writer. So, uh, so yeah, those are the things for me. And so cover is a start. Yeah. But that being said, let's talk a little 1970s disaster film. What do you, what do you think? Well, I mean, did you like it? I mean, I know you hadn't seen it before. So I'm not going to lie to you. Like, uh, before I, at this point in state, like at this point in my life, before I see a movie, I'm going to, I'm not going to read any spoilers, but I'm going to like, all right, what do people think about this movie? Right. And going into it, it wasn't super well loved. That always surprised me. It was yeah. never very popular when it came out. Yeah. And I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say a couple, I'm going to say a couple truths to you. One I don't think this movie's perfect, but I got to tell you, I had one hell of a fun time with it. Right. That's the thing. I, I love the movie. And, you know, I like 60s and 70s thrillers. Uh, we talked about uh, Three Days in a Condor last time. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I go for that. 
But three things really got it for me. Number one, again, it's a high concept. It touches something visceral in all of us. Whether you like amusement parks or not, and I don't particularly like them, but who hasn't been in one going 40 miles an hour in a roller coaster or upside down in a -a tilt-a-whirl thinking, I really hope this is safe. What happens if something happens? And that ties into that really well. Uh, Number two, the cast. Oh, my God. I mean, we've got Henry Fonda and Richard Widmark, not really in cameo roles. (laughs) You've got George Siegel, Susan Strasberg, Harry Gardino. There is a very young Helen Hunt even. Very young Helen Hunt. I think she was like 13 or 14. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that's cool. I love to watch good acting. You had a like a you had a cameo of a very young. I think it was it Steve Gutenberg. I think Steve Gutenberg yeah, yeah. has like a cameo. Like I mean, he's not Steve. He's not the Goot at that point. But yeah, Steve, a oh, very well, young uh, Steve, um, uh, Steve Gutenberg. What's his name? Who was the guy who was in Ghost Story and Greg Wasson? Oh, he's also in it. And uh, so that's number two and number three for me. A good thriller's got to have a good villain, an mm-hmm. interesting villain. And for me, uh, the Timothy Bottoms character, and they never give him a name. Yeah, he has no name. And and this is something that I, I'm going to let you go on it, but uh, I want to bring a connection to a 90s movie that that his character reminds me of in a second. But I just please finish your thought. Yeah, uh, he, always, he reminds me of Mr. Data from Star Trek if he was a sociopath. He's emotionless, Mm -hmm. you know, barely cracks a smile, very smart, very ruthless, wants what he wants. And you you almost feel he's also got a little bit of an ethic. If I get my money, I'm going to leave you alone. You get he says that and it's you get the feeling it's the truth. But he's kind of emotional. He's kind of almost robotic in his his methodical Mm-hmm. Teacher, not caring who gets hurt in the process. Right. And uh, that's similar to my Conrad Hilton, except Conrad Hilton is much more playful. Mm-hmm. He's not he's not emotionless. Yeah. But but yeah, so that's that's the, the character. He's very interesting character. Uh, you never root for him, but you kind of admire him. He's he, he's it. A- He's an inter- yeah, he's an interesting villain in the sense that yeah, you you don't know his name. He I mean he's not given a name. You also and you know, I've I've had a lot of time to really analyze this movie over the past 72 hours, uh just in preparation of this conversation, but he doesn't he doesn't necessarily have any as far as I can tell any real motive for what he's doing. He doesn't really have a backstory. But I also I'm not really completely concerned or interested in it. Right. It's just money. They don't say why he needs the money or wants. Right. Mm -hmm. He's just uh, like I said, he's almost a little bit like a Terminator, except uh, he's got a little bit more emotion than a Terminator. But right. But Um, his kind of emotionless element in in some respects reminds me a little bit of John Doe from Seven in the sense that he's he's just doing his thing and again it like john doe he has no name they call him john doe because john doe is literally nameless right? right um and obviously he does have this kind of dare i say kind of like ryan o'neill kind of look about him yeah um in the 70s but he's he's an interesting villain and there there's very much like a cat and mouse element at play in this movie right and um all the while, but what what I love is our 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 hero is a very very seventies George Siegel with uh, just yep. the, the, this, the ultimate seventies mustache and a suit that okay. like George Siegel's always been kind of cool but also kind <laughs> of uh, goofy in an element. But damn, if like nineteen seventies George Siegel wasn't just like the coolest guy, I'm, I'm telling you, I just I I thoroughly watched every minute, even just having him for fifteen minutes yeah. go around on different roller coasters and look completely uninspired by being on them is well, also kind of comedic gold too. And he doesn't want to be the bag man, but uh, yeah. and in some respects, I I duplicate some of that in checkout time. 
mm. uh, not in the same way, very, very different settings, very, very different ways. But uh, again, we've got a bag man. Um, but yeah, I was going to say, if people, if your audience, your listeners, if you, if you, if 70s movies or 70s styles, music, dress, if you don't really, if you, that grates on you, probably not a good movie for you. Because as you said, this is quintessential 70s. Yeah. In the music, in the way people dress, in the way people act, in the trying to quit smoking with the electronic shock. And oh, all. that was such a great scene. And, such and a great scene. That, that is that is all very much 70s. Yeah, I uh, I love that. But it also gives you a little... Um, sometimes, and, and this is one of those elements of just even storytelling or even writing in, sometimes it's a, kind of like a show but don't, like show and tell or show but don't tell. Like right. we... You know, he, he wants to quit smoking. So you get that scene of an ashtray filled with hundreds upon hundreds of cigarette butts. And he's going through like an electric shock therapy. Yeah, yeah. He's not saying I need to quit smoking. And like, uh, it's literally a show element. You you get what's going on, but you also learn a little bit about who his character is right. in that moment. So it's it just, it, it's, it's. And he, he's also very much the government bureaucrat. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, they, you get kind of, people in government and there's some that are still very interested and there's some people in government that are total washouts you know they don't do anything whatever most of them just plug along and it's kind of like the dmv you know <laughs> Fill up the form, hand it over i'm here till four and that's it you know it's uh it's very blasé you do your job you, you shuffle along i love the interplay with him and henry fonda yep. his boss who you could tell that, although they really don't even like each other, <laughs> they, they work together and they're both sarcastic. And, uh, you know, they don't, uh, they, you don't, never get the idea that Henry Fonda is rooting for him. <laughs> you, you know, it's, it's funny, you, you bring that up and it kind of parallels a little bit in Three Days of the Condor. You know, even though he wasn't necessarily connected with uh, the, the FBI, he was his own, you know, like book reading guy. But nobody liked Robert Redford either. So I'm kind of curious if anybody in the 70s in in the FBI, if they if they liked any of each, like if, you know, or it just seems like an organization that they don't like each other. Well, yeah, I think that's true in the CIA or in uh, and it's not that they don't like each other. You certainly develop friendships with people there. But it's like there's no common goal. You know, you're with a, with a company, for example, a drug company or or an auto company or whatever, people are striving for uh, advancement. People are striving for uh, their team to win and maybe get a bonus or something, designing a new vehicle or whatever. You don't really have that in government. There's a few highly political people who are jumping up the chain, but most people's just a stumble along worker bee. Mm -hmm. And I think they show that pretty well. I try to show that in checkout time I, uh, in an entertaining way, a humorous way oftentimes, where uh, uh, Tom Tom has a, has a has, uh, interchanges with his oddball boss. Um, but people just kind of shuffle along and you, you take your 15 paid holidays and your, you know, your, your, four weeks of vacation and all that stuff. You take every bit of it. Uh, and uh, you just come in and shuffle along. And right. after, after 20 years or whatever, you collect your pension. But, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a good thing though. When you take a character like that, whether it's Tom, Tom, Tomasinski or uh, Harry Calder in uh, uh roller coaster, you take them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, you have to. You take them out of their schlepping along. And now you've got these people who are not only are they not used to doing this kind of thing, whether it's being a bad man, bad man or chasing a bad guy or firing a gun or whatever. They're not only not used to doing that. They're not used to doing much of anything outside of their outside of their uh 
comfort zone. Right. And and that's where and that's what really story is, is conflict. Right. I mean, you, you need to you're only going to your heroes are only well, their heroes are only going to be as good as the villain. But your heroes are only going to be heroes if if they do have to go through hell in some capacity. They have you to, have they to, have to. Some obstacles. They have mm-hmm. to get outside their comfort zone. They have to have uh, life and death situations. Um I was uh, I did acting for quite a few years in in Ohio and New Jersey, and was fortunate to be trained by a student of Uta Hagen. I'm sure you know Uta Hagen, the uh, famous uh, acting teacher for H and B Studios in New York, and also a great character actress. She was in things like The Boys from Brazil's. Uh, she played the, the the concentration camp guard that they have under arrest. But uh, and my my instructor made a point of saying, like when you're doing an improv or something, don't just look for a realistic choice, acting choice, action. It should always be an interesting action. Mm -hmm. Never be boring. Never dead end an improv by being the boring guy in it or whatever. Right. Because 90%, 95% of people's lives are boring routine. No one wants to watch that. Right. And no one wants to read that. So you basically distill the, or potentially very interesting, very high risk, high stakes parts out of that, maybe over a a 30 year or 40 year life, and you distill them down into 300 pages or two hours on film. You know, it's, uh, as you said, drama is conflict. We kind of like talked a little bit around this movie, but if you wouldn't mind, we're, we're talking roller coaster. Would you feel like comfortable? Hey, uh, for those that haven't seen this movie, and there, I mean, it's a movie that came out in 1977. Would you feel comfortable giving us like a little like plot summary of what this movie is about? Basically, uh, it, it, it's set in the world of the uh, uh, amusement park industry, and it kind of begins outside of after we introduced to Harry Calder, the protagonist, with a bomb being planted in a roller coaster. And of course, loss of life and terrible things. And Harry Calder, the uh, protagonist, happens to be the, he works for the government uh, certifying amusement park rides. And he's the one who certified this roller coaster as safe. So, he gets then uh, uh, caught up in the search for this bomber who is trying to extort money from a group of amusement park, a consortium, basically. And uh, pay me my money or more of your rides will be booby trapped. Uh, you're vulnerable. And like in the ways of kind of like a Dr. Evil, give me one million dollars, right? One million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and which was a lot of money in 1977. Sure. A lot of money, but um, so, yeah, so it's we're introduced to this nameless evil guy, you know, nameless sociopath who's out to get his money. And, uh, you know, he becomes interested in more than just. The money after a time, he becomes interested in the money and in Harry Calder and maybe making him jump through some hoops in order for uh, to humiliate him a little bit Mm -hmm. where he gets his money. So that's basically without giving away the the whole plot that basically summarizes what's going on. And like I said, you take this milk toast government bureaucrat, which George Siegel plays very well. That's a good character for him. And you have to put him through the hoops. You know, this is this is well outside his comfort zone. Uh, not only is he doing things he doesn't you know, normally do, he's doing dangerous things. Mm-hmm. And put into a new role, that of detective. Uh, clashes with the FBI who think they're the detectives. You know, so uh, uh, very inter- in- interplay with those. Again, great FBI uh Special agent by Richard Woodmark later yeah. in his career. Yeah. Now, by out of curiosity, did you did you see this movie in the theater at all? No, I did not. I probably first saw it like on a late show thing, probably in the late seventies, 
something like that. Um, maybe early 80s. When I was first in veterinary practice in the early 80s, I lived with my brother for a couple of years and he had Cinemax. Okay. So we saw a lot of movies that were pretty cheesy. But every once in a while, there was a little gem like this. Right. This, the Satan bug, uh, the power, <laughs> things like that, that would show up from the 60s and 70s on Cinemax. And, uh, you know, it's always like finding a little jewel. You know, right. You're finding, per- you're finding a pearl in the oyster. I, I, I ask because, well, one, I'm always fascinated of like where people discover a film. But two, this movie had was part of that kind of the that 70s uh gimmick thing of the what was it called sense around sense around yeah sense around midway had that this yeah that that was a big deal back then they put the extra bass speakers in so that it it vibrated when the stuff went over yeah did you see any movies in the 70s with the sense around oh yeah i saw i remember watching the movie midway okay Heston and that one comes to mind. I can't think of other ones, but you did really feel it kind of in your gut when the bombs went off and stuff. It was a, there was almost a shock. Right. Uh, did it make or break the movie? No, Mm-mm. but uh, it was a nice little gimmick. Not quite a, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Castle, William Castle. Like yeah, in the, not, not the like William Castle gimmicks. But, right. Uh, but, uh, but it was a nice little gimmick and, uh, you know, they tried to do different things to get because that's again, that was a time when uh, TV was really taking over and the theaters were trying to do gimmicks to get people to, to to come to the movies. Yeah, absolutely. And everything is kind of cyclical, right? I mean, you always see in different eras movies that kind of like pair each other, like in the in the 90s, there was kind of the uh, the meteor uh, thing. So you had Deep Impact and you had armageddon and then you had volcano and you had dante's peak and you had a myriad of other movies that have like kind of like parallels in the 70s it was kind of like the decade of like those natural disaster films right or other like so you would have like you well even if it wasn't natural disaster but disaster movie disaster films like so like airport the first one was probably airport Mm -hmm. the other versions of airport and i always thought it was funny my wife and I love Airport. We think it's a very nicely done movie, entertaining throughout, good acting. Uh, Burt Lancaster, who was the star of it, hated it. He thought it was the worst movie ever made. <laughs> you know, I need to go back and see it. I completely forgot Burt Lancaster was in Airport. Yeah, he's he's kind of the lead. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen it since I was a kid. Yeah, and uh, uh, but you know, Airport, Earthquake. Um, uh, Poseidon Adventure. Poseidon Adventure, yeah. Powering yeah. Inferno. Powering Inferno. Ether, Meteor. Not Ethan Allen. What's his name? Something Allen. Allen. Something Allen. Uh, Irwin Allen. Oh, all yeah. His, all his movies, yeah. Yeah, and um, I guess really, I only bring that up. I was just kind of curious if, uh, obviously, Airport being one of like, the early ones. And, I mean, we've been talking about this. If you uh, – because I remember loving the Poseidon Adventure – like and towering in front. I I loved all this this stuff, but this uh, this film somehow like escaped they're, they're my radar all, growing and up. They're reflected in things like Die Hard, which is just another take on it, where yep. it's disaster, but it's in now it's terrorists. You know they're bringing in the terrorists in the eighties and nineties, and uh, uh, so yeah, it's uh, those things a cycle, like you say, they just get a different twist to them. Yeah. If I may, like when I think of criticisms, because I mean, again, this is a fun ride. It's a fun ride. I mean, if you're if you're wanting it, you know, to be I mean, it's high concept. I mean, it, the movie does have its, its its holes or its flaws. And one of and again, I thoroughly enjoy this movie. So, you know, I read some of the critiques. No, I, My I own, pardon me. I agree with you. You have to suspend your disbelief in spots. Mm-hmm. My critique and it, it's so kind of silly and maybe it's just a product of the times that we're in. I feel bad for saying this, but apart from the 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 opening scene, there there's really virtually no kill count in the movie. You know, it, it's it's a weird kind of criticism to have, but yeah. but the the element of danger. It's like we we see we see a an incident in the beginning, um, and then it's just a little bit more threat of incidences. But I don't know. I I don't know. Part of me feels. The movie could have had another another piece 
in the movie that, just to- that, is, that is old school. Alfred Hitchcock used to say, you put a bomb under someone's seat in the theater and you you keep cutting to the bomb ticking down. He goes, valid. that builds suspense. That's valid. This movie is a little bit more Hitchcocky. Right. You never let the bomb blow up. Yeah. That's actually a really good call that you bring that up because, yeah, in many ways, I mean, it's not classic Hitchcock, but there is there is some very Hitchcockian elements. I mean, that's part of the reason why I do enjoy this movie is um, is kind of the we we see it. We see the character like and then suspense is really told with we know what the character doesn't know. Like right. so where where I feel that sometimes um that some movies fail is that the audience isn't give. I mean, and sometimes it can work. You can have a character smarter than what we're going, but sometimes it's cheap. If, if you're just given something at the end without any real kind of like payoff where it, it wasn't necessarily earned or uh, I'm trying to find a way to kind of better explain this before I go on a different tangent. Um, in the case of Psycho, we we have that famous scene where uh, Artigas, Artigas, I think that's it, is walking up the stairs, right. right? And then we see the door open. Artigas doesn't see the. I keep calling him Artigas. I think that's his name. Arbogast. Arbogast. Um, and goes up the stairs. Also, by the way, another great character. Oh, fantastic! But I mean, you know, any I. I apologize ahead of time because if we're going to go down at Alfred Hitchcock, uh, uh, <laughs> I'll, we'll, we'll be here all night because that's that's my guy. I love Alfred Hitchcock films. But we see Arbogast go up. We see the door crack. We see Arbogast reaction. will not even respond because he has no idea. He gets to the top and then, um, you know, our, our killer, I'm not going to spoil, Psycho, which is a movie that's over, I guess, at this point now, 60 years old. Uh, oh, but... Yeah. You know, uh, don't want to spoil anything for anybody, but that's suspense where suspense isn't um, a character just going up the stairs and then just somebody stabs them. There, there's there's no build up. It's just that is a uh, what's the word that is just that's more like a, just a, a jump reactionary scare there. It's not suspense and suspense is really the audience knowing something that character doesn't. A great example, even in a thriller, because, I mean, jump scares can work, but the most chilling scene in the movie Halloween is where Jamie Lee Curtis is in the house and she knows something's weird and she's seen all these bad things and she leaves a room and there's this dark room behind her and she's walking. And then you see um, you see Mike Myers like white mask behind her, but she hasn't seen it yet. That's more terrifying in the movie than Mike Myers, any any killing that he does in the film, we've got we are experiencing something that the person we're tracking is not. And that is classic suspense. That I think does work. And I apologize if we're going completely on a different tangent, but I think that is that kind of ties into some of this conver- of the conver- conversations. Well, that, well uh, roller coaster, I mean it certainly has suspense where uh you know the bomb you worry about the bomb. Is it going to kill people? You know, whether or not it does, you know, that's that's a part of building suspense. But another thing about this movie, and which is true of some thrillers, it's a little bit of a police procedural. Mm-hmm. You see how, how do the FBI and the local police respond to something like uh, a bomber trying to uh, 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 a extortionist trying to pick up his money, right? How does how do they f- track him? How does he defeat them back and forth like that? So it's got a little bit of that to it as well. Um, yeah, yeah I, I think it builds the suspense pretty good. It wasn't as high budget as some other movies, so it doesn't have that going for it. Uh, and- yeah, I mean, it was a pretty modest budget, but it also got buried behind the fact that it came out just a couple weeks after Star Wars, right. which is a movie that just it changed the game. You know, obviously everything that and it's like these things are little hidden gems and they never get a lot of uh, people. People don't rave about them. A lot of people don't even see them. 
Mm-hmm. That's true of uh, roller coaster, and yet they 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 are a fun ride. Yeah, no pun intended. Uh, you you just brought something else up into the into the fold because we are now in the you know the the the. Well, I mean, this movie at this point, this is seventy seven. So this movie is approaching fifty years old in a couple of years, give or take. This movie, I, full disclosure, was not the easiest movie to track down. Uh, it's not available for streaming anywhere right now. There is a shoddy, not full version of this movie available on YouTube. But the only way you're going to get it is by purchase. Unless... DVD right over here. <laughs> yeah, unless you if unless you own it, right? So for, for the listeners, if you want to get your hands on, you're going to have to purchase the film. Unless you live in Atlanta, because... And this is just kind of like a plug that I've got for a... Uh, they're not a sponsor. They're an unofficial sponsor. But locally, we have we still have an active video store that's not just existing, but it's thriving here. And I called them up, you know, uh, not too long ago. Like, hey, by the way, do you have Roller Coaster from 1977? He's like, oh, yeah, it's in my, my 70s disaster category because they have a whole category of 70s disaster films. And um, which is just kind of like I said, just a little fun uh, plug to Videodrome, uh, the the local video store that we have here in Atlanta, because in this day and age, people are streaming through Amazon or streaming through Apple. And if it's not available there, unless you have it on DVD, which physical media is almost kind of dying in many respects. And if you get on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or whatever um, and look at the DVDs. Typically, they're pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. I mean, nine dollars, twelve dollars. You know, you're not. It's not a major investment. I see these these oddball movies that are hard to find, and you'll see people say, "I want one hundred sixty seven dollars for it on eBay or whatever." No, I'm not going to pay that. No, 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 one hundred percent. If you if you can find it for a lot of times, you can find these things for eight, ten, fifteen dollars, and. You know, sometimes, usually not in Blu-ray when they're this old, but uh, certainly in a good quality uh, theatrical release. Yep. And the one I've got was, uh, it, it's a Blu-ray. It was uh, kind of like redone by Shout Factory, which they they take yeah. movies and update uh, the, the the quality and put some good uh, supplemental contact uh, content on it. But this is just kind of my plug to the listeners. Physical, uh, physical, Media is still very important. I'm looking at John's uh, collection uh, behind him. A little part of the the 600-some videos that I've got. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, continue to collect. You know, don't rely just on the cloud. The cloud is – it's great for what it is, but there's nothing wrong with having that physical physical media. I I still prefer having an actual novel that I can hold. There's nothing (laughs) against – it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with Kindle's uh, I, but, I read books, but I prefer the actual book. Yep, same thing. Uh, I listen to everything, but I prefer my vinyl. I prefer having the physical media itself. And uh, that goes with, again, with this movie. So if you can get your hands on a physical copy, watch it. But John, this is so much fun. But I want to I wanna, I wanna close out by talking a little bit more, again, just kind of, kind of sandwich uh, a little bit more discussion on checkout time. How can people find it? Uh, and anything else you'd like to close out with but as always, this has been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation. Open invitation. Write some more. Uh, write some more stuff so I can have you back. Or if you just want to talk more seventies movies or whatever, love I love our conversations. Talking, always love, love talking movies. But uh, checkout time is available through Ingram, so it's and Amazon. So it's every place you can order a book. You can order checkout time. Uh, easiest way to get to it is. Checkouttimenovel.com, all one word. I own the domain. It takes you directly to Amazon. Uh, it's available on Kindle for $3, which is pretty cheap. Uh, hardcover and paperback. And uh, and if anybody wants to contact me and is interested in a signed copy, uh, just uh, contact Andrew and uh, uh, or can even go through my uh, website, uh, thrillerjohnb.net and uh, send me a send me a note and uh, we can arrange to get you one. Perfect. Dr. John, I can't thank you enough for... One more thing I want to say. 
Hey, anybody reads the book, I hope you like it. And if you do, Amazon review. The best thing you can do for an author is to review on Amazon. It takes five minutes and means a lot. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And for the listeners, uh, I will have links to to, to John's works on, in the show notes to so take a look there. So direct a link for this. I'll take you to his website, Thriller John B. And uh, I can't stress enough. It, it's been an absolute delight chatting with you again. You take care and um, and, and and thank you again for introducing me to uh, to this uh, this fun ride. Now I'm just going to go down a whole '70s disaster uh, film uh, kind of uh, adventure over the next few weeks, going back and revisiting Earthquake and Airport and uh, Poseidon Adventure all over again. So, Wait, it's actually got gotten funny in some of it's such stick that it's actually <laughs> got funny when you watch it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. All right, everybody, John Bukowski. Thank you much. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you to John for joining us. I had a wonderful time. Hopefully, everybody had a great time listening to this podcast. And if you are still with us, please do me a favor and take a look at the show notes where I will have links to John's website where you can purchase checkout time, as well as information where you can learn a little bit more about Sense Around or information about the movie Roller Coaster. And of course, you can find out more information about my website, stampercinema.com. And if you haven't already, please leave a review, subscribe, tell your friends, and come back because we will be back next week with another episode of Stamper Cinema.